Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Saviour's. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Andy McPherson, vicar here, and it's great to welcome you this morning. Um, I, I, I just sense that there's a number of people here who are feel privileged to be here this morning. You just feel a delight and a joy to come into God's presence. Because today is, it's like the first Easter morning, it's like the first Pentecost, it's like the first Palm Sunday when we're able to gather together. And I was thinking about all those people for whom this Sunday, for whatever reason, they're not able to worship together. The persecuted Christians around the world, maybe people in uh, areas of warfare, uh, people who are sick and suffering, unable to gather together. And it is a real privilege of God's people being able to meet together. So I just wanted us to remind us that God's good all the time, all the time. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. And his love endures forever. An opening prayer. Father God, we thank you for the privilege that it is to meet together as your people. And Father, we pray that even today we will receive a fresh power from on high. And we will know that we are in the presence of God in our worship today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our presence. And we pray, Father, that you will bless our time together. In Jesus' name. Amen.
to see you in this place, not just a bunch of friends and some musicians, but to see you standing here in the midst of us, arms open wide, waiting for us to see you. Amen. So our children and uh, young people are going off to their groups now. Let's pray for them as we do so, as they do so. Father God, we thank you that uh, you are God who longs for us to meet with you. And I pray, Father, that our young people will meet with you afresh today. We thank you for the restoration of uh, Jez uh, and his coming back to uh, uh, work today and Father we pray for your blessing upon him and his group in particular pray that they will receive a special blessing from you we pray in Jesus name Amen okay youngsters off to your groups good to see you back Jez <laughs> And we have our two Bible readings now. Joe and Chris are going to come forward to... Oh, no, we are not. <laughs> not following what we're doing. Um, I think we've got a confession coming on the screen. Is that right? There you go. Chris Moy said to me earlier, it's good when things don't go smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. We say together, Almighty God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, cleanse us from our sins and help us to overcome our faults through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our Heavenly Father, who's promised to forgive all those who sincerely turn to him, have mercy on each one of you, deliver you from your sins, and strengthen you for his service through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. And now Chris and Joe are going to come forward and lead us in our Bible readings. Uh, The first is going to be our Gospel reading from John's Gospel. And then the second one is a, a reading from 1 Peter. We're going to do it in that order today. Today's first reading is taken from John, chapter 21. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you were wanted. But when you were old, you stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And the second reading comes from 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. To elders and young men. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. Let's pray. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open the ears of our hearts and help us to receive and hear from you today. Amen. Well, there are some phrases or sentences that are instantly recognisable, either for the speaker or the occasion. For instance, probably the most famous is Martin Luther's I Had a Dream, or Winston Churchill's We Will Fight Them on the Beaches, or maybe you remember Houston, We Have a Problem, or even They Think It's All Over, It Is Now. Words are powerful. They can build up or knock down in a second. Verbal communication is a wonderful gift and the bedrock of society, but we should use words carefully. My dad, an English, Latin and RE teacher before he got ordained later in life, was a bit of a stickler for words. He was a whiz at the Telegraph cryptic crossword and even did it on the morning before he died that evening. Quite impressive. <laughs> But he was a a stickler, as I say, for words, and uh, using words well and carefully. And he quite often used to quote Thumper from the Bambi film to us children. It ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it, which is very true. Well, the written word is also powerful, and we need to take extra care when writing, as there's no tone, so misunderstandings can easily arise. I remember thinking when my children were waiting for news of university places or um, a job application, they only actually need to read the first three words, we are sorry or we are pleased, and then they'll know. But the spoken word is of particular significance because we can personalise it. I wonder what words you would most want to hear or the most heartwarming to you. You've won, you've been accepted. I love you, you've passed, I was wrong, you look wonderful, I'm sorry, maybe I've done that job you've been asking me to do for the last 25 years, or sometimes we just want to hear well done or thank you, or if you've spent any length of time with young grandchildren, isn't it wonderful when you hear it's bedtime, much as we love them of course. Well, I came across this amusing little piece, Six Things You'll Never Hear in Church. It's my turn to sit in the front row. Well done. I was so enthralled, I never noticed your sermon went on for an hour and a half. It won't, don't worry. Personally, I find dropping notice sheets into letterboxes much more enjoyable than golf. I volunteer to be a permanent teacher for Sunday school. I love it when we sing songs I don't know. And Vicar would like to send you and your wife to this all-expenses-paid conference in the Bahamas. (laughs) Bogner wouldn't go amiss, eh? (laughs) Well, we all have different things we'd like we like to hear. According to a Gallup poll that asked people what they most wanted to hear, the three top things were: "I love you," "I forgive you," "Dinner is served." Well, that's interesting as we come to look at this marvellous passage in John's Gospel. If you have sight of a Bible, you might like to turn to John 21. You may think that it feels like John's Gospel has ended with the closing of chapter 20. 
But John, in whose gospel alone this passage is included, never wastes words. And there's obviously something important he wants to impart. And it is to do with Peter and his cataclysmic failure in the courtyard of the high priest's house, where he denied Jesus three times. What we discover as we go through this passage is that Jesus is going to make him confront his failure, not in order to humiliate or destroy him, but to heal and liberate him. John 21 shows us that the call is bigger than the fall and that God is a God of restoration and second chances. So here we are at what was actually the third resurrection appearance when Jesus meets the disciples on the beach after a fishing trip. The resurrection of Jesus is vital to the Christian faith. If there was no resurrection, then his death would have been a hopeless end. But his resurrection turns it into endless hope. There were several recorded resurrection appearances and probably many more unrecorded, as John states at the end of the chapter. And those recorded are to... <laughs> okay. Mary Magdalene, the other women at the tomb, Peter in Jerusalem, the two on the road to Emmaus, we'll hear about next week, ten disciples behind closed doors, all the disciples with Thomas, excluding Judas, seven disciples whilst fishing, 11 disciples on the mountain, a crowd of 500, Jesus' brother James, and those who watched Jesus ascend to heaven. Well, we're going to focus on the character of Peter as we look at the interaction between Jesus and the disciples following the fishing trip recorded in John 21. And the following passage, where some of the most important words Peter will ever hear are spoken. Interestingly, Jesus' first words to Simon Peter were, Come, follow me. And his last words to him were, Follow me. Between those two challenges, Peter certainly had an up and down journey. For the most part, he did follow, but he did stumble and falter along the way. Of all the disciples, I think Peter gives us encouragement. We may wonder what Jesus saw in him, this hot-headed, hard-working, impulsive fisherman. He was perhaps a bit of a liability that Jesus should invest in him, even calling him the rock. But when Jesus chose his disciples, he wasn't looking for the finished article. He was looking for real people who were willing to follow. People who could be changed by his love, then communicate that love to others. That love and acceptance that is for all of us. And we know that Jesus accepted Peter with all his failures and shortcomings, and Peter went on to do great things for God. And we are accepted too, because God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. The good news of Easter is of being forgiven, chosen, loved and filled up. Peter had had a turbulent week from Palm Sunday through to Easter Day. In fact, he's had a fairly turbulent three years since first meeting Jesus, and nothing had been normal following Easter Day either. Peter and, his, and the disciples have returned to Galilee, to the sea where it all began. They had left Jerusalem, the upper room, the cross, the empty tomb, and the house with its locked doors. I imagine they were feeling lost, lonely and confused. When someone you love is no longer around for whatever reason, it can be very hard to know what to do, but most of us need to do something. Peter decided to go fishing. It was safe and familiar. He knew how to do it and it would pass the time, the long night ahead. What was going on in Peter's mind? Surely the events of the last week of Jesus' life the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the charcoal fire, denials, the crowing rooster, the arrest, a cut-off ear, falling asleep, three dark hours, the empty tomb. He cannot forget these things. He cannot shake off his feeling of failure and guilt. And now Jesus has gone. Peter needs distraction, and so he fishes. Perhaps he was also fishing for answers. I'm sure we've all done that. We've gone out into the night, as it were, 
uh, looking for answers for our profound questions of life. What was that all about? Who am I? Who was Jesus? Where is Jesus? What will happen to me now? Peter was searching for meaning and a way forward by going back to his roots and the certainty and security of what he knew, which was fishing. Well, we know the story. They catch nothing. They knew the sea. They were old hands, most of them. They knew where the shoals of fish were likely to be. They knew where you were more likely to make a catch at night, but it didn't work. But just as dawn was breaking and they were stretching and shivering and feeling tired and fed up and ready for food, Jesus shows up, although they don't know at this stage that it is Jesus. So somebody on the shore, somewhat annoyingly, tells them to put their nets on the other side, as if they hadn't caught, thought of that. And of course, they catch loads. Only John at this point, who refers to himself as a disciple who Jesus loved, recognised Jesus in the dim morning light. As soon as he says to Peter, it is the Lord, ever impulsive Peter is straight into the sea to greet him, leaving the others to haul in the heavy net. And Jesus has already prepared a fire and cooked breakfast for them. Jesus has already met their need. Do you notice that Jesus doesn't actually need their fish? They've caught an abnormally huge amount, showing the abundance of Jesus. He doesn't just provide enough for them, he provides enough for the whole village. John, in whose gospel alone this story is related, in describing this scene, isn't wasting words. He's not padding out the story. John never fills in with unnecessary asides. He was there and it must have had a vivid impact on him. He's telling us something about working under Jesus' direction, something about the relation of our work to Jesus. Jesus knows our needs, but allows us to, as it were, succeed under his direction. Jesus welcomes Peter's catch. He even asks for it, but he doesn't, in that sense, need it. The charcoal fire is very significant. Sometimes, in order to experience healing, you have to revisit the place of hurt. The courtyard charcoal fire, where Peter again and again and again gets it so terribly wrong, must have come back to his mind. The smell of the fire, the terrible haunting memory of denying Jesus, especially as it was Peter who in chapter 13 states he will remain loyal to Jesus, he would never let him down. And Peter, in Matthew 16, who declared, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus, at that point, called him the rock, feeling shame and anger and frustration with himself. He knew that Jesus knew. He knew that John knew. And hearing the cock crow and Jesus' words come true, nothing could erase that memory except revisiting it and bathing it in God's healing. What is the symbol of this for Peter? Nope. Oh, okay. Emptiness gives way to the abundance of a net full of fish. Peter felt empty without Jesus, but his encounter with him again filled him with peace, hope and purpose. The darkness of the night gives way to the light of the morning. This charcoal fire offers hospitality and acceptance rather than the rejection of the last one he was sitting at. The Last Supper has become the first breakfast. Despair gives way to hope. John 21 is a wonderful passage with life-affirming, healing, challenging, encouraging words. And John sets the scene beautifully. Notice how Jesus uses a meal, as he so often did, as the context for Peter's healing. Peter's relaxed, his physical needs have been met, a full net of fish and a full stomach. And now we move on to what is possibly one of the most spectacular interchanges in the whole Bible, verses 15 to 19. The three questions that Jesus asks correspond, obviously, to Peter's three denials. 
three for completeness, but also three for reminder and healing. There it is again, the smell of the charcoal fire, Peter's night of agony. But because of Jesus' night of agony, Peter's can be dealt with. And so Jesus takes Peter away from the others. We see in verse 20 that the beloved disciple is following. I imagine they were walking along the shore, a place of familiarity and safety for Peter. And Jesus asked Peter the question that goes to the heart of it all. Do you love me? Interestingly, in some translations, he calls him Simon Peter, Simon being his name before he met Jesus. Perhaps he's helping Peter bridge his before after life, affirming that life as Simon, the fisherman, but reminding him of Peter, the rock, and emphasizing that he knew him inside out. The first two times Jesus asks, he uses the Greek word agape for love. Agape is the deepest, fullest, purest form of love. It is self-sacrificial love. And Peter applies each time with the Greek word philio, signifying brotherly love, great affection. Maybe Peter knows himself a bit better now, remembering how he has in the past blurted out his undying love for Jesus and then fallen short. Perhaps he didn't want to risk it. The third time Jesus asks, Peter used, Jesus uses the word Peter used, philio. And here we see that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. Why? Because Peter had denied Jesus three times next to a charcoal fire, and now he's been asked to affirm him on a beach three times next to a charcoal fire. And Peter rightly says, Lord, you know all things. He did for Peter, and he does for us too. But he knew that Peter needed complete healing from three denials. And the only way for that to happen was for Peter himself to voice his love three times. There's much commentary on the use of the different Greek words used, but I rather like Tom Wright, who in his book, John for Everyone, says, it's probably not actually that important. Phew. <laughs> what is important is that the question was asked and answered three times, and even more importantly, each answer earns not a pat on the back and, well, that's all right then, but a command. This is the most remarkable thing, that by way of forgiveness, Jesus gives Peter a job to do. When Peter professes his filio love, Jesus says, feed my lambs, look after my sheep, feed my sheep. This is a fresh challenge, a new commission, time to learn to be a shepherd. So the most vulnerable, lambs, through to the more mature, sheep, a teaching and a pastoral ministry. But more than that, Jesus is sharing his own words, his own ministry with Peter. Sorry, I seem to have lost my last page. <laughs> there it is. Peter went from strength to strength. He was muddled from time to time. He made mistakes. But he was greatly used by God, as we will see on the day of Pentecost. He became a shepherd in the church, loved Jesus, and looked after his sheep. And drawing to a close, referring to the reading from 1 Peter, to the elders and the flock. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter had come a long way. He had witnessed Jesus' death and resurrection. He had been forgiven, reinstated and commissioned. He preached at Pentecost and became a pillar of the Jerusalem church. But writing to the elders, he describes himself as a fellow elder, not superior. He asks them to be shepherds of God's flock, remembering exactly what Jesus had told him to do. I imagine Jesus' words rang in his ears throughout his ministry from this encounter on the beach. Simon Peter, do you love me? 
I'm so glad John included these words at the end of his gospel. What words might Jesus be saying to you today? As we reflect on those words uh, that uh, we've received from Jesus, let's uh, uh, sing again now. And the song for reflection is, Will you come and follow me? Let's stand to sing. And uh, as we go into our next section, um, I, I, just, I found out that you really appreciated it when the vicar wasn't here last week. Is that right? Can I uh, thank Mel for last week in the way that she took up the uh, service at very last moment and brought about a, a wonderful event last week, I think. But one of the things that we discovered from last week was the way in which um, uh, uh, we'd like to hear what's going on in our church's life. And so we've now got Vicky and Matt who are going to come forward and they're going to share something about what went on during the Alpha course. You want to find out about that, don't you? Yes! And guess what? It's good news. <laughs> Morning everyone. So we've finished the 11 week Alpha sessions with the help of eight fabulous leaders and hosts. We have had 14 participants through the program. Uh, we've learned so much about ourselves and each other and our groups and more importantly about God's great power and love. The connections we have made have been genuinely life changing and it's been a privilege to be part of the process. Thank you to all of those who contributed to the food preparation and organization we provided nearly 500 meals and gained many compliments for the delicious food. The conversation and discussions were always lively and again the groups really bonded and shared some deeply personal experiences. We felt wrapped in prayer from the ever active prayer warriors 
uh, WhatsApp group and those who prayed throughout the sessions. Um, some of the comments on the evaluation forms were, I've been surrounded by love, lovely, genuinely people, and I thank them all. The friendship shown has helped me when times were hard, and I've learned something each week. Uh, this week, 17 of us met for a meal at the Cooper Dean Harvester, and the conversation last flowed. I felt the Lord was uh, with us smiling. We didn't want to leave, lead Alpha. Um, both Vic and I felt woefully unqualified and inexperienced. Our only experience for us as participants ourselves, which we had completed separately and found useful. We still feel very new Christians and, and don't understand a lot of the words or know prayers in scripture by heart. We struggle with praying out loud and still find the peace terrifying. However, <laughs> God, <laughs> however, God had plans for us and it's become apparent that we were meant to lead Alpha at St. Saviour's. A few weeks before, we didn't have enough helpers and hosts and not enough participants. But, this, the, week, but the week before, we had 15 participants and plenty of help, especially from experienced Alpha Christians. We also had some difficult family news. Um, Vic's mum was diagnosed with, with terminal pancreatic cancer, and we were worried about how we would manage this and the responsibilities involved with our jobs and busy family life. We both felt that Alpha needed to continue we needed more God in our lives and, and not less. We were talking this morning and we think actually we can remember being in, in church and thinking oh, we don't, you know, we want Alpha to happen but we don't really want to be the people in charge of it, let's be honest. And then in the prayers somebody prayed for Matt and Vicky as the leaders and we looked at each other and thought, oh, <laughs> somehow I think we are. So there you go. Um, my mum expressed an interest in attending Alpha and you know, to be honest at the start we really didn't think she physically would be able to manage to come for the sessions. Um, at that point to be honest things, things really didn't look good. Um, it looked like uh, you know, she may not even be alive by the end of Alpha being really honest it was, it was as bad news as that at the beginning. Um, my mum attended every session including the Holy Spirit Day um, where she had a really profound experience and became a Christian. Um, she's responded, oh god I'm going to that. <laughs> She's responded really well to the palliative treatment, so it, it is still untreatable, it is incurable, but she's responded really well to the chemotherapy. Um, her life expectancy has increased from the three to six months we were told at the start up to 18 months now. Um, and the, the doctors have described the cancer that was in her bones, because it was already in the pancreas and in the liver and in the bone, which, you know, you don't really have to be medical to know that that's, that's not great. They describe it as melting away, and they, they can't explain it. She's responded better than, um, than people generally do. Um, I don't want to use the word miracle, but, you know, it is a miraculous end to what, at the start, I really thought, she's never going to manage these sessions. This is going to be heartbreaking to us, and how are we going to get through it? So... I often say that Alpha made me a Christian, but it was actually really the start of the journey to faith. Um, many of you will remember Christy, um, who's now in Poland, but she invited me to her home for my first taste of Bible study ever. Um, this led to a home group at Cornwall Road with Daniela and the lovely Jean that I think many of you know as well. And over time then this evolved to Giles and Nat. Um, who'd come from Australia. And this, again, this amazing sort of, we talk about God incidences, you know, when things just come together in a way that you just can't imagine. We were in a really difficult family situation. We hadn't been able to worship in St. Saviour's on Sundays. Um, we don't even, we've been watching all the videos, which is, is lovely. But we really wanted that home group support. We wanted to learn from other Christians. We want to be part of a group. But we couldn't leave our house. Um, and then Giles and Nat moved to, from Australia to here and were like, we really want to run a home group, but we're living with our in-laws and we don't have the space to run a home group. So it was a perfect situation really that just came together. Um, we were able to learn from some really experienced Christians. It was, it was a lovely process. Um, I don't know what it says about our home group that everybody's now emigrated. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it led to Matt and I stepping up as leaders for a home group in a way we would never have done. Um, and it gave us that opportunity. Um, so yeah, as I say, I'm not sure what, quite what it says about us as a home group, but you know, we were, we were really glad of the experience. So it was always our desire to offer Alpha participants support after the program and to try and find a way forward um, as a home group. So our plan is going to be that we will be meeting in Tuesdays here at seven o'clock. Currently we've got 12 people that were some of the hosts and leaders and the new Alpha participants. Um, 
it's a lovely problem to have, but if the group grows, we've got the space here to be able to have more than one um, small discussion group. So we're really excited about that. We're going to embark on the study of Mark. So if anyone here is thinking they'd like to be part of a home group, it is an open invitation to anyone. You'd be most welcome. Please let us know. Um, we have learned so much through the Alpha process. It did take me to week 10 to learn how the dishwasher worked. Um, I do wish I'd learned that earlier. <laughs> you know, we, like anything, we would structure things differently, we'd change things around a little bit, but we feel really blessed to have had the opportunity to serve and to meet and develop relationships with people in our church family. Um, you know, we really, often we do say hello. We're not particularly sociable people. We don't find those things very, very easy. But the deep conversations we had with people here um, that we have seen in passing all the time, um, and through Taste Life as well, that, that I did the eating disorder group as well, has been really, really lovely to feel part of part of a group. And um, certainly for me, when we were at that harvesting meal, we think that's the only time we've actually been out for a meal with other Christians. It was beautiful. It was so lovely to see everyone laughing, everyone hugging, that, that joy together was, was really lovely. So this is not the end of Alpha for us, uh, or St Saviours, or anyone that was involved. Um, the impact and changes, I don't want to share other people's journey, I have permission to share my mum's, but, and I can't, I don't feel like I can particularly talk about other individuals, except to say that there are certainly two or three individuals who's, who, it could be life altering, life altering for them, you know, we could really see the changes from when they came on week one to the end of the programme, so, you know, and as I say, it's not the end, so many of them are going to continue on with us, and I think they are still searching, but I think that's good, they are searching in the right places, so, you know, we feel confident that they will they will find their, find their path. So we intend to run Alpha again, possibly in September, we've had that discussion. So um, please continue to pray for Alpha, all those people that are in the group. Um, play for home groups wider as well. I know many of you are part of home groups. I think they're such a valuable part. So uh, pray for all of those things as we all develop our faith and relationship with, with Jesus. I'm going to leave you with two Bible quotes. When we first started to find faith, these quotes were like stalking us, weren't they? Like literally everywhere we went. <laughs> they were appearing on billboards and cushions and people were saying it and it was in films and music, literally everywhere. So Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Thank you. Thanks. And Matt and Vicky, uh, our heartfelt thanks to you as a church. Uh, we want to thank you for the way in which you stepped out in faith in such a wonderful way. And uh, do you see the way in which when we step out in faith, God honours it. And that was a real blessing. Uh, that has been a real blessing to our church, uh, uh, that Alpha course. So thank you so very much for stepping out in faith in that way. Maybe that's the theme of today. I don't know. Anyway, let's continue on as we are led in our time of prayer. David and Margaret are going to lead us in our prayers together. Let us pray. Lord, we want to bring our worship and praise to you today. We have sung earlier <clears throat> how deep the Father's love for us is. What a comfort that is to us. And we thank you, Lord, for this assurance. We thank you also for sending Jesus into our world to be our Savior by dying on that cross, but to rise again, giving mankind eternal hope. Thank you that your love is unconditional and for all the blessings you give us. Help us to be worthy of your love and show it to others. We are only too aware how constantly we fail you. At times it seems we only give lip service to you and go about our life in a way that pleases us and not you, Lord. And we can only humbly ask that you forgive us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we look at the world today, with all the atrocities and conflicts going on, we feel so helpless, Lord, 
We so much take for granted the liberty and freedom that we have in our lives. And yet in so many parts of the world, people are suffering greatly. In comparison, we lead in the main such a safe and peaceful life and are sometimes tempted to ask, why them and not us? Uppermost in our minds at present are the conflicts in the Middle East and in the Ukraine. We ask, Lord, that Israel would use restraint so that the starving people of Gaza can get the food and medical supplies that they so badly need and that all steps would be taken to avoid the political situation escalating into an even more major conflict with all its repercussions. Our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine who have had to endure so much in the last couple of years. Lord, we ask that the leaders of Ukraine and its allies are able to find a way to achieve peace. Please, Lord, will you intervene by your mighty power so that the war can come to an end? Then there are Sudan and Yemen with their brutal civil wars and the power struggles going on which have led to famine across these countries. Lord, we cry out to you that in these places and in so many others, hostilities would cease and that innocent people are able to live their lives in peace and freedom again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so we turn our focus now to our own country. We pray for our national leaders in the difficult jobs they have. We ask that you will guide them to make good and wise decisions that are in accordance with your will. May they serve with integrity. May they strive to put aside their own personal and party interests and instead make decisions that are in the best interests of our country. We pray for all Christian politicians that they will be strong in their faith and receive your wisdom in influencing events. And with local elections coming up, we pray that honest and upright people will be elected who will serve with compassion and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we've just been hearing about the Alpha Course and it's just so exciting to hear all that has been going on. And we thank you for each person who came to find out more about the Christian faith. They will have learnt much about what it means to follow you. Now we pray that they will continue to search for you. Lord, please keep your hand upon each one. And for those who are wanting to continue to meet together, may they come to the point where they, like Peter, hear you say, follow me, and respond by opening up their lives to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we continue to pray for Ella, serving you with Latin link in Guatemala. Will you be with the group in all the activities they undertake, whether it's physical building work, working with children and families, or taking services. Please protect the group from illness. Keep them safe as they travel around. And may Ella not only serve the local church where she is, but may this experience deepen Ella's faith and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our newsletter, we're reminded each week of the many people who are needing your healing touch. Will you please bless each one and meet them at their particular point of need? Some need physical healing, some your comfort in times of sadness, some your peace in their anxiety. Whatever it is, Lord, please bless them today 
and in the days ahead. And in a few moments of silence, would you like to offer up to God prayer for someone on your heart who needs help today? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let's close with saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. To everyone who's been a part of our service today, um, just a, a few items of news, church family news that are going on. Um, you will have heard last week, if you were in church, that our annual parochial church meeting. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> <laughs> our annual parochial church meeting is taking place on the 12th of May after our morning service. It is good fun, I promise you. You hear about what's going on in the wider church and uh, what has happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future. So uh, there you go, our annual parochial church meeting. And, uh, but in order to uh, make votes at that meeting, uh, you have to be on our electoral roll. And so uh, it was very convenient that Mark, yes, there she was. <laughs> Margaret, who was leading the prayers, is also our electoral roll officer. So if there's anyone who um, is not currently on our electoral roll, and that's not the local parish electoral roll, that's, this is the, 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 our church's electoral roll. So uh, please do ha um, have a word with the, uh, uh, Margaret at the end of our service, and she's got those forms for you to fill out. By the way, I hope there's no confusion. You only have to fill those forms out if you are currently not on the roll and you are wanting to come onto the roll. This is not an annual, a general revision uh, uh, where everyone has to fill out those forms, okay? So it's just those people who are new uh, are wanting to get onto the roll. Uh, so see Margaret at the end of our service. And then next Sunday afternoon, Claire, we've got a special event happening. Uh, the St Peter's Choir are going to uh, be performing a concert in church. There's a, a notice about that on the community <laughs> notice board just down this way. Uh, tickets are available. Um, and Sharon was saying something to me earlier about that, but it's all a bit complicated. But uh, it, it, can they see you if they want tickets? Okay. Poster. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, Sharon's ad adapted the uh, poster <laughs> so to say that. So tickets still available for that event. If you don't get them online, you can get them on the door, but they're the same price, <laughs> basically. Um, so I think that's all the, the church family news, except to say... During the singing of our next song, our uh, collection is uh, taken up, and then at the end of our service, there will be prayer ministry in that corner um, and refreshments in the link. And please, please help us to move things. Go and see Kaz at the end of the service. 
So we stand to sing our final song, I Will Offer Up My Life. peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon each one of you and those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen.